It reminds me of um, an experiment. I mean, there's a radio dish, right? In Australia. Yeah. So this experiment was actually con conducted in just, after the, just after the Second World War by Gonzales and Wilson. And they had a radio dish. And so they were radio engineers just pointing their dish. It didn't look like a dish. It didn't look like, how did you describe it? A giant's bra cup. Yeah, exactly. A discarded giant's bra it, cup. There's a huge one in Japan which looks like a giant miso bowl. Oh, right. And that's how I described it. I used to live right beside it. And the thing is, they're huge and they move quickly. Right. Because you think that they're massive, but when you actually see one move, it's mm. remarkably quick. It's quite frightening. Look. Okay. It's just, it's just a, um, they did that experiment. So they looked up and it was a, it was an experiment, to, a radio uh, experiment. And they looked up and then they noticed that in radio, at least, the entire sky was bright. So they, that experiment, in some sense, was conducted. OK. Yeah, and so they just looked up and they said, OK, let's look that way. So, and uh, I mean, even if you did it in this room, you'd see a light and say, yeah, that's bright. And then you looked maybe down at the floor and it looks less bright. And you look in different directions and it looks different. But they actually conducted that experiment. And so when you look. With okay, your... so how does that not entirely contradict what you were just saying? So why is it <laughs> radiation in the visible light waves, we don't get to see that, but radio waves, we get, it's all around us. That was, and so this is, this is, is, that was radiation right from the very beginning of the universe, when the universe was much, much smaller. Right. And so there it was one consistent fireball at one temperature. And uh, we see uh, that radiation in the expanded universe. It was thermal radiation. It was in infrared. And okay, so I, I understand that, but I still don't see why all of our sight lines don't go back to the Big Bang, which presumably was incandescent, which presumably emitted light as well as radio waves. Ah, so at some point, well, actually... You see, no, you see, he has no answer to this. You should no, see his no, face. It's fake news. Not, this, this, is it's not, all this, fake is news. Not, uh, this is a, a subtle way of getting out of this. <laughs> okay. If you look at the light, if you look at this, these, these strip lights, are they transparent, opaque, or, or is it just really bright? Is the, you know, there's a question. If you saw a really bright, is the sun transparent or opaque? Or is it just crazy bright, and all you see is the radiation from the sun? So you could have something intrinsically which is transparent. So if you switch off a light, the right type of old energy and efficient light bulb, yeah. you can see straight through. Right. With it on, you effectively just see the light. Yes, OK. So. Um, so, you know, which is it? Okay. The, the early universe was opaque, literally opaque. So you couldn't have seen through up to a certain point. Okay. Right? So there was at some point, and so what we see in that uniform radiation is just that opaque surface, the last. So at some point when it's very, very hot, you, there's just a hot fireball, which was intrinsically opaque. It was like a metal, like a shiny metal surface. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, the universe cooled enough and the electrons and the nuclei joined together, becoming neutral therefore unable to interact with light in the same way. And the whole universe turned into a glass. So imagine you had molten uh, silicon oxide and it, like, you know, some red uh, uh, molten glass. Mm -hmm. and then you let it cool, and then it just becomes transparent. And so that's what happened to the universe. And that was much after the Big Bang. Okay. So you do see that heat, and now it's in the radio waves. Right. So that experiment was conducted, and it freaked everyone out yeah. at that time. But I don't think anyone attacked anyone else. No, that would be, that would throw bleach in their eye. I think that th those guys were only a couple months in radio astronomy. They were transferred in. They did their experiments. I think mm. a year or two at most. I don't think they spent their, their life. Right. There's, radio astronomy, there's been a few interesting awards and Nobel Prizes right. for electrical engineers who effectively just sh got shipped in. Because really, it's just a post-war period where people had invented radar and mm. all this technology. So yeah, that experiment was done, and it was uniform, and it, so it was very strange. And they were convinced it was an experimental problem. They just conv right. convinced it was an issue with their equipment. Yeah. So in some sense, that experiment has been conducted. There we are. <laughs> so, uh, but that's, so this is just after the war? Yeah. So the, the Big Bang was still being debated as a theory? Yeah, it hadn't, and this, this hadn't reached kind of consensus in a scientific sense. Yeah, in, in that sense, the, I think they reported their results. They said, OK, we've got this consistent, uniform, single temperature of radiation across the entire sky, unchangeable, really, really uniform, like exactly the same. And, uh, and there was one Big Bang theorist who proposed this idea that you should be able to see the relic radiation. Yeah. And that at some point, these radio engineers and uh, this theorist were connected together. I forget his name, the name of the theorist. And, mm. and then, and then uh, there was even a prediction for what temperature it would be, how hot it would be. So, so there was a prediction for that. If you, if you uh, 
if you listen to crackle on the radio or any kind of interference, some percentage of that is that microwave radiation. Mm -hmm. So you, you've heard it, you've seen it, if you had an old television when you were trying to tune in the television. That, some fraction of that noise is always coming from, 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 that, from that. But it's not that paradox. It's, not cause, it's actually because the universe is very finite in extent. Because it was small okay, and yeah. compact. But then that, that, that would also, I mean, I suppose, were Alba here, he would say that should also, if the universe is small and all the light from all the stars could reach us, then we should also see a bright sky. But you're saying the reason we don't see a bright sky is because the universe is too large yeah. and it's, it's split off into different yeah, it's expanding and split. zones so that the light from all the different stars can't, hasn't had time to reach us. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it is interesting. The reason it's interesting, I think, is because the scientists are in the business of illuminating the universe, of, of making things clearer. That's what you do. Whereas a lot of art is about opacity and, and strangeness and um, mucking, mucking things up. That there's a larger narrative, I suppose, that that uh, you, as a, as a working scientist, are a child of the Enlightenment, which is when a lot of your discipline was, was forged. And the Enlightenment is called the Enlightenment because it's this idea that <laughs> well, now we're going to shine the light of, of rationality and truth and logic and science, the experimental method and gathering data. This will, this will illuminate things. This will make everything clearer. Yeah, but the Aufklärung. Yeah. It's interesting because if you look up, I mean, I'm, maybe it's hard here from Egan, but it's not... You can still see some stars. If you go somewhere darker, you can see more. We're in fact in a phase of, because it's not just these points that have lived forever. If you, if you looked up, the universe is what, 14 billion years old? Four, yeah, so 14 billion years old. If you looked, what would it be like if you were here a billion years afterwards? Was it more bright? What if you were here five billion years after the formation or mm. 10? When did, when did our sun form? When will it be there? Are we actually at a bright point now? Will it get brighter and brighter and brighter? Yeah, we'll, yeah. Or will it get darker? Well, eventually the stars will all burn out, won't they? They've only got a finite amount of fuel. Exactly. So what will happen to what we see now? And I would say, in, actually, probably we're in quite a luminous uh -huh. phase. Right. So at some point early on, there was this uniform radiation and stars started points of light started firing up and you started seeing these interesting things and they, they conglomerated together and formed galaxies and you had these different structures. But there are some stars which are very faint and they're going to live for a long time. The projected lifetime of small stars are, is, is te five, five times longer than the universe has already existed. Our sun has been around for one third and, and this planet has been around for about a third of the age of the universe, a big fraction. It's not a new mm. thing. And so I think we're actually at, although we see mainly dark, yeah. Yeah, we're at quite a luminous phase. But there's going to be a long, long period of time. A <laughs> long, long. When there is no light at all, all the light's gone. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. But so that's, so uh, ultimately, I think, ultimately, in, in this discussion, which I maybe if I represent the light <laughs> and you represent the dark, yeah, yeah, dark's going to win. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, this, ultimately, darkness is going yeah. to take over, yeah. I mean, at some point, stars will have used up their fuel. So even if it was infinite and so on, it, is it, if it, yours, there's, the, there's different arguments, okay, maybe it's infinite in extent, so it's massive, but then maybe it was formed with a finite amount of material, an infinite amount of material. Mm. Physics doesn't like infinities, generally. No, it doesn't make We're, a lot of sense. But there is this, and I don't, I don't want to get too kind of Darth Vader about it, but there is, <laughs> if, one of the things that's attracted me about the idea of Olber's paradox is, if, his hypothesis were true, which of course it isn't, because we can look in the night sky and we can see it's mostly dark, but if it were true, it would be intolerable. We wouldn't be able to live. We'd be blasted with light and radiation. We would we'd, we'd die. It would be like yeah. having your eyelids cut off. It would be a ghastly thing, that we need a certain amount of darkness. We need to be able to um, hide. We need to be able to... Um, we need the, the obstacles to illumination in order to make life bearable, which is kind of the point of art, in a way. So that's, yeah, that's well, okay, so it's, a, it's the point of art, you could say. It's also, I think, the point of theology, which is why the character in my story is a, is a reverend. He's a blind reverend. Because the, um, the, the, 
the, the conflict, if you like, between science and religion, which, again, light has been winning, I suppose, over the, the last few hundred years. Religion used to say, we can explain well, the way the universe is and why things are the way they are. We can explain what lightning is. It's a god who's angry and is throwing his hammer at you and so on. And science comes along and says, we've got better explanations for these things. Um, we can prove our explanations. And increasingly, it takes away all the, the discursive power of religion. And it leaves religion in this rather difficult place where it, it has to retreat into a kind of negative theology. It has to say, there are still mysteries that science cannot penetrate. And presumably, as a scientist, you want to shine your light into all the corners and shadows and illuminate everything. You swine. <laughs> <laughs> but, then, but then the view of the science. Don't you? I mean, isn't that your, isn't that yeah, your business? Then, isn't that what you're then, about? But then we don't try and take away from the beauty of that thing. You know, the, the, if you took a picture, although a, a completely functioning understanding, I don't know, the lights for me are a sort of metaphor for the uh, an analog for the stars, which we can't see right now. A, a, t a completely functioning understanding of how a star operates doesn't take away for one second the beauty of that object. So I'd agree. Yeah. So looking at looking at those things, I do think there is, in some areas, a closing down of the ability to to, to theorize and to and scope and range. And this is a, just as much as a problem for physicists and scientists as it is for people who don't want to be constrained. Yeah. Uh, who want to write about fantastical and different things, mm. and we find it just as constraining to travel. Uh, speeds less than the speed of light. I mean, having this very, very low speed limit to, 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 to live on a small planet which you can't get off and very difficult to extract yourself from. Wouldn't it be better if we could just go somewhere different? Mm -hmm. So we find it just as constraining. The, the, recently, dark matter and dark energy have left a massive hole in our, our understanding, which we have no functioning uh, theory. The dark energy, we don't even have a good theory. Dark matter, we have a few theories, and we're trying to find mm. those, those particles which we think there. So, I, yeah, there is a retreat, but there, there's also big new doors that we, which have been opened. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, and we keep on addressing questions which are further and further away. So, uh, kind of related is the, uh, uh, I mean, you could have these paradoxes, but you don't, it doesn't have to be infinite. It could be um, in a weird topology, like uh, like a like a donut yeah. or a or a sphere. You could be in a, sh a, a configuration of the universe, which is if you went far enough in one direction, you just pop out on the other side, mm. or you, there was a shortcut round the torus in the other way, and that would produce. Would it produce total brightness? I don't know, but it, I suppose it would depend on the geometry of it, wouldn't it? Have the size of it and the. Yeah. But would it produce some interesting optical effects? Yeah, opposed to. A, a weird similarity between what you see one direction and another direction. So, and that we are really trying to investigate. Mm. So maybe there is some shape to the universe. And really, by looking uh, in cosmology and in, 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 in astrophysics and cos cosmological measurements, is trying to understand the geometry of the observable universe mm. with that proviso that you, you 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 eventually hit a wall and you can't look much beyond. In fact, but we can start beating down that wall all the time. So instead of looking in light, look in gravity waves. And they would pass through this opaque barrier. Yeah. And so maybe we can see in a different, maybe we can look in particles or gravity waves. We don't just have to look in light and radio and in invisible light. We can look in different ways. Mm. But with, I think there is serious consideration to actually try and understand the entire stage that is space and time. So but that, no, that is, that is clearly science, isn't it? That's a, that, that's a mission statement for science. <laughs> Whereas I'm, I'm trying to make, I suppose I'm trying to make the case, and I, I, I understand the appeal of that, and I, we are curious beings, human beings, we want to find stuff out. But there is also the argument that John Keats, the famous English romantic poet, makes. He talks about what he calls negative capability. And negative capability means the ability to remain in doubt and uncertainty. And he thought that Newton was a kind of villain because he, he refused to allow human beings this necessary grain of doubt and uncertainty and not knowing everything about the universe. He thought that that destroyed the beauty of the, of the rainbow. And you're saying it doesn't. You understand the rainbow? Look, it's, it's a spectrum. It's, it's diffracted by raindrops and all this sort of stuff. He says something is lost when you've explained something. 
I, see what I mean? Yeah, I, no, I do. And I, I think the, the only way I can describe it is like uh, being uh, bilingual or enjoying, uh, enjoying something. A bit. There are pieces of fiction which have errors in them and mistakes and things that you know not to be true. Yeah. And that does, how often does it really disturb you? <laughs> and like, there's a fraction of the time when you pick up a book, like yeah. some, some obvious glaring error, which I've been there, and they call it asphalt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know that's just rubbish. Yeah. And then so, so my my point is that you it's all being like bilingual, you can pick it up. You would happily converse in one, one way, mm. and then you quite happily put that down. Go and watch Star Wars. Yeah. Really enjoy the fact that the laser beam is not travelling at the speed of light, and yeah. can be held by a mystical force. It's very cool. It's very it's very yeah. cool, and so that can be completely suspended. So. That it's remarkably easy. Okay, there are some scientists, and I don't know how, much, how many they number, where they, they, can't, they can't do that. They would mm. be too exasperated, but they're in the minority. So I, I see it as enjoying two different things, which are separate, and being able to switch between those two things. There's no one preferred language, one preferred type of music, food. It's just different. You know, one has a greater predictive power. So, mm. But I, I, see, I see your point. There are some times where I'm upset that we can't, we are so constrained. Yeah. I, I hear what you're saying. I, don't, I think I'm saying something slightly different though. I think I'm saying, and I, I'm, I'm offering this in a, in, a, in a sort of devil's advocate sense of the term, that not to put words in your mouth, but I would assume from knowing you that you see the universe as physics and maths and a bit of chemistry and a bit of biology, but that's kind of a sub <laughs> subset of the physics and the maths. That's the, kind of, that's the core truth of the universe. Yeah. And things like stories, which is what we're talking about, Star Wars or science fiction novels or whatever they might be, they're diverting and entertaining, and they're also part of life's rich tapestry and so on, but they're not core to the way the universe is. <laughs> the universe is basically physics. Yeah, yeah. I, I... So if we imagine, if we spin that about and say, what if the universe is to, people, to entities like us, fundamentally a story, because that's how we make sense of things. And some of the stories that we tell are these interesting scientific stories, but that makes physics a subset of what I do. <laughs> it's a power grab. It's, um, and nothing, nothing makes sense without that, the way that our mind sorts and arranges um, events and, and things and people and narratives and it's interesting because I, I, spend a, I spend a term teaching about stars and almost everyone from school knows what happens to a, how a star is formed. And it is a narrative. Yeah. And I will, I will go into my lecture and, uh, say, okay. and say this is the narrative and we go through the school, the, the, yeah. the, 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 the school book. We all know there's a big gas cloud and it collapses and eventually gets really hot, kind of explodes and starts burning fuel and so on. Mm. And, uh, that narrative doesn't have, you're right, doesn't have equations and so on. And I'm really dismissive of the narrative yeah. at the time. This is like, a, this, is a school, this is a school story that you learned, mm. but there's no equations in it. So we can't, there's no, there's no, there's no you know. Yeah. Um, but to, to, to my credit, I replace, when, when I have dispelled a narrative with the, yeah. the, the, phys, the devil physics work, I replace it with a story which is based on physics, oh, okay. which is inaccessible to those students. So, okay, so maybe we lose one story, yeah. but um, there's always another. And so I think there are... There, there well, are yeah, and, I, and the thing about stories is they're so potent, they, are, they can be distorting. So a different science would be evolution. And the, that rebus, which we can all picture, which is, shows a, a chimpanzee, and then it shows a kind of ape man, and then it shows a Neanderthal man, and then it shows a homo sapien standing upright, and each one is taller than the other. And that tells a story that says evolution is a progress, and that we are advanced, more advanced than our evolutionary ancestors. And every biologist I've spoken to says, that's not true. Evolution is not a progress, it's not going anywhere. It's, evolution is simply the you know, DNA, keeps throwing up lots and lots of different ways of making more DNA, and we're one of them. We're quite a successful one at the moment, but who knows what it'll be like in a million years. There's no upward path. There's no narrative in that human satisfying sense. But that's so deeply embedded in the way that we think about things, it's very hard to extract it. 
it's, it's yeah. I think you're right. I think you're actually right. We do uh, even within physics. There's there's the the, the, the the bedtime physics stories you you tell your small physics kids, mm. who who about the, the the progress and how how these thoughts originate, and they're turned into a, a modern mythology, mm. right? I mean, from Newton to Einstein, of how these things were invented. And I've wanted to meet these. I want I want to meet. To, uh, I, Okay, maybe a few cases, Einstein, Feynman, probably Newton, they were, they were regarded as amazing at the time. But there must be somebody out there today. Maybe. I don't know, did they contribute to the book? Maybe. I don't know. But when you meet them, do you actually know, or do we create the story of how yeah. they became their, their great discovery? Mm. Do, we, do we create that and create that narrative? I've always wanted to meet th you know, th that, that giant of physics. Not, I mean, I mean, but that's, that, I mean, that in, a, in a sense is exactly what I'm saying, yeah, exactly. isn't it? So I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not here to, to disrespect bit. Professor Stephen Hawking, oh, let's right, say, right, right, right. who's, I'm sure his contributions to your field have been many and important, but the reason why Stephen Hawking is the most famous scientist alive today is because there's such a compelling story to tell about him, about this brilliant mind that's trapped in this wrecked, ruined body. That speaks to us, that, that speaks to us on a human level. Now that should be independent of the actual contributions he's made to physics. I don't know, where do you stand on Stephen Hawking? Don't stand on him, <laughs> that would be cruel. No, but I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I become more and more convinced that, that, that we create this, the, the, these stories about these individuals and then we turn them into these giants mm. at some level. Yeah. There is also a trend that physics is just more difficult, more complicated. Like, so thought experiments themselves, I mean, so fundamentally most of the thought experiments exist for a reason. And that was because the experiments were hard. Mm. And there was a, a, an amazing link between philosophy and, ex, and, and coming up with new theory. And so Einstein was the, one of the greatest. And some, some, some of his thought experiments really turned into things which you know, both all forms of relativity, general and special relativity, really had their, they had uh, mm. a, a star, a nucleus in, in thought experiments. And so, but those days are gone. To have a, a, have a, to have a, thought, a simple thought experiment, what if uh, I couldn't travel faster than the speed of light? Or what if I was in an elevator with no windows? Yeah. Or, I mean, it's not, not quite a paradox. That's when a thought experiment goes wrong. Yeah. If you were going to watch it on Channel Five, like when thought experiments go wrong, <laughs> <laughs> and then and then there's no way out of your uh, of your you create a paradox. Because what's inter what's interesting about that to me is that we're now kind of describing a meta Olbers paradox. Because I, I absolutely understand what you're saying, and it's true in my discipline as well. There was a time when a very well-read person could have read everything. But that's impossible now. There's no way I could spend my entire life reading and I wouldn't make a dent on the, the amount of stuff there is to read because the amount of stuff there is to read keeps increasing year by year, faster than I can catch up with it. Bertrand Russell said he thought William Hewell, who was a 19th century um, British scientist, was the last person who knew everything there was to be known according to the logic of his own day. And Bert Russell was saying, I've spent my life studying all sorts of things and I can't know everything there is to know. So now we end up with lots of specialists who know a narrow field really, really well and have a broad sense of the, the rest of it. But we've reached this stage where there's so much material out there that it's... So another way of putting it would be, I did, my first degree was English and classics. And one of the things that's great about the classics, about ancient Greek and ancient Latin classics, is most of it got burnt in the library fire of Alexandria. Oh, yeah. so, uh, Euripides wrote 90 or 100 plays, and Sophocles wrote a similar number, and Aeschylus wrote fewer, but even so, we have seven plays by Sophocles and seven plays by Aeschylus. And that's easy to read. You can read the entire works of Aeschylus in a day if you want to. And that's because the chance has intervened and, and dis discarded and destroyed the complete run. And whole, you know, all the other playwrights from that period, and there were dozens and dozens, all their work has vanished. So you can read, uh, I think it's 15 Euripidean plays and seven Aeschylean, seven Sophoclean, and you've read all the Greek tragedies that there are. And that put, puts you in a very strong position. So it's the, it's the opacity that makes it viable, that makes it work. If, if becoming a master of Greek tragedy meant reading thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Greek plays, you wouldn't be in the same position. Yeah. But what I'm saying is your business is, if we expand the definition of light to mean all the radiating energies yeah. and radio waves and so on, a kind of, a kind of light, then your whole life is looking into the light. Yeah, I mean, even 
even, I mean, for humans, I mean, our interaction with everything, even the physical interaction with the material around us is the interaction of light. Mm. It's actually the same, the same force. Right. So it's, it's uh, the electromagnetic force that stops my hand going through the table. And so the, every, everything that you, you'll come into contact with. Except for dark energy and dark matter, which well, is not light. Well, I mean, well, maybe, you know, it's, but then which it's like, is the vast majority of the cosmos. Well, maybe it's passing through us. Right now, there's a certain amount of dark matter here. That would explain why I feel a bit queasy. Well, but you don't interact, you don't interact <laughs> with it. <laughs> maybe, yeah. No. Yeah, so, so yeah, there is. So what I'm saying is, I, part, when I like you, I, we're talking about constraints. It would be great to travel faster than light and to have a space elevator and so on. It would be great to be able to read all the lost East tragedies, but there's a part of me that's glad that we can't because it makes that discipline manageable. It makes it human size and you can then get on top of it. Do you I, see what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I think what it does do is make people creative. Mm. So you're trapped. And this is not trapped by an imagination or a limited imagination, mm. but trapped by the reality, the, the, the state of physical law. And so, and that, is remarkably constraining. You think, well, wouldn't it be nice if, if you're a planetary scientist, or if you are a, a stellar, you know, a, wouldn't it be great to fly out of the galaxy and look at the galaxy? Wouldn't it be great to go to another planet mm. and to be to have your perspective reduced to the uh, to Nabokov's little dot of light, literally yeah, where you can yeah. even see a full character, right? So you could just work out, you could just deal with one character at a time with your, ink, you know, with your with your pen and your ink. That's all we really get. Mm. We think there's another planet, we just see a little, little dip of light from that planet. We see our galaxy from a weird side suburban spiral arm. Mm. You know, we see all these little bits and little fragments of pieces. And so it does make people creative. It does drive their imagination mm. and, so, and how to, 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 to look around and see does physics work in different places. Is it all consistently the same? So it does, it drives a different form of creativity, let's say. And if, uh, if there are a set of rules which take away the ability to the freedom, physics is also a generator of uh, variations, let's say. We've reduced, maybe we have some laws of physics and then we can understand how the universe will evolve. We write that story. Um, there are a lot of people that do tweak it, but within ranges, what if, what if there was a bunch of stuff we can't see? We'll call it dark yeah. matter. What if there, what is, what is the universe expand? Is it expanding or is it, what if it expanded forever? What would happen? What if it crunched back down again? Yeah. So, but it's, it's, it's let's say it's limited. Let's say it's, it's more it's, limited than, I, I, yeah. I always feel jealous of you guys because <laughs> it's, because I feel like we're limited. Yeah. That we don't have that. Well, that's, that, I suppose that's the, yeah, that's the point I'm trying to make. So yeah, Nabokov, he, he loves the spot of sunlight. That's beautiful, but he can't write with it. He needs the black ink to write with it. And that's the, this, there is, I think, a, a shaping narrative, again, a meta narrative, if you like, that comes down to us from the Enlightenment that says, this is, what, this is our business now. This is a, let there be light. We're shining light into all the dark corners of the universe. And the thing that, that piques my interest as a writer about these discoveries with dark matter and dark energy is just how much there is, how much of the universe by proportion is this unilluminated stuff that let there be light, which is the first thing that happens in the, in the Bible is, is kind of not right, actually. <laughs> no. Creating a cosmos, the cosmos we happen to live in is very, very, it's very small portion of it is light. Most of it is not light, is, is what you can't see, what, what, what isn't immediately obvious, what can't be illuminated. But then which is a kind of negative capability, which puts negative capability as a... Yeah, but then I think it's, I think it's just a, a perspective change. Because if you, if you looked in, in radio waves, you'd see a different mm. picture. And if you looked in, say, particles, so you, or you were just sensitive to protons flying through the atmosphere, you'd see a very different picture. If you, if you could only see in radio waves, if you could only see in radio, you would look at, you would look at the Earth and uh, it would look like a, met, a beautiful, shiny metal sphere. Mm because it's all reflective. It wouldn't look blue and green. Yeah. It would look like a perfect metallic marble floating in space. And you'd see things totally different. Yeah, because yeah, it's, cool. it's reflecting. So it depends on your perspective. So we just, it, we evolved to see in one particular brand of light, mm. which was most useful. And that's the one, the sun generates that. Mm. But if we looked in different forms, if we were sensitive. So if you were this huge being that just looked in radio waves, you would see a completely different structure 
and a different thing. So even then, it's kind of challenging to think about you know, the, the light. What if you, only, what if you were yeah. made of dark matter, you only interacted with dark matter? then you would see a completely different uh, environment. So it's, it's very specific to what we call the light. Yeah. Yeah, because there's, there's so much other brightness out there. That's, that's Stephen Baxter's a very famous, more famous than I am, science fiction writer. That's one of his, his big ideas. He's written many novels about this. He thinks that dark matter is uh, an alien invasion. He thinks that there are <laughs> creatures, he calls them the tachyon birds, and they're invading our cosmos. They're kind of creeping in by stealth on this huge time scale, and eventually they're just going to possess us and wipe us all out. And we should be much more alarmed about this than we, <laughs> we actually are. But what you don't, what you can't see, what you can't see, and you can't interact with, I think, uh, I think it's an interesting idea. And we, you know, there is a dark, dark matter. There is. Uh, we don't know what it is. Yeah, it's all around us. It's kind perfect. Of a lame name for it, isn't it? What would you call it? If you, you know, if you had artistic license and you were going to rename some of this stuff, I don't know. Dark energy, dark matter. Um, you have, you had, uh, you had, you had some, you had carte blanche to uh, change. Uh... Dark just seems slightly weak beer to me. I don't know. The, what would you call it? What should we call it? Should we rename dark matter and then we can petition the <laughs> unknown, complicated, <laughs> interacts with not, not much else uh, matter. Yeah. Not non non luminous matter. I think it's it's yeah it's it's it is the it's it, it's very easy to to just kind of speculate in a way that's unanchored from actual data, which is kind of what I well, do. You do I suppose. see it, but though, it is you know dark matter, dark energy are kind of the negative capability of the universe. And they're they're, they res, they're repelling and resisting our abilities well, to make sense of them. We do see it, so in fact we have light. Huh? Yeah, we have a little tiny bit of light. Then do we do we rename it, or do we just leave it dark? Light. Yeah, yeah. light matter. <laughs> New, not yeah. so dark. Grey matter. Mm. Well, that's too much like a brain. So yeah, no, we we, we could, I, could could we rethink physics as such? So the the reason you like equations is because they're more. Unless I'm, correct me if I'm wrong. You like them because they're more precise and more accurate than words at describing important aspects of the physical universe. I would say, yeah. I would say that's definitely true. Yeah. But that presupposes that precision and accuracy are virtues. It... Oh, that's just a little bit, <laughs> a bit fi fighting talk now. <laughs> um, just just saying. <laughs> so, no, because I, I don't think it's those things. I don't think it's those things which really appeals to most physicists. I think oh, okay. what appeals to is the equation can can flexibly change and j explain, give you a narrative of why a system works the way it does. Mm. So it's not because it's very precise. It just happens that some theories are extremely precise. Yeah. Incredibly precise, like unbelievably. So much so that physicists have started believing nature really loves mathematics and equations. Yeah. There's, there's some deep connection that we, we could, there's no, there's, uh, we can't say why nature likes mathematics and physics, a mathematical description, but it definitely appears mm. there's something there. But it's, I don't think it's that. The, oh, wow, we've measured it to 20 decimal places, wonderful. But the, the, the equation, it gives you flexibility. So you can see a phenomena that you've never encountered before, and then you would do something uh, which is great in science fiction, and then you would use that science to try and understand something which is brand new. Of course, you, you work from behind the, behind the Wizard of Oz curtain <laughs> and then generate, no, vary, vary yeah. the science to, yeah. to see what happens. But w what we do is we do exactly the opposite and we, we look at the phenomena and say, would our hopefully precise equation, but it doesn't have to be, describe this thing? And it's mm. a kind of game, match it up to, to try and see if you can bend. So I don't, I don't think it's the precision. It's not that clarity. Okay, no, I can, I can see that. And I can also say what you were saying earlier is clearly true, that we're talking about there are different ways in which things can be beautiful, and the equation can be beautiful, and once you've explained the rainbow, it doesn't stop the rainbow being beautiful and so on. But I think what I'm, what I'm talking about is, okay, so I'll talk about a kind of revelation that I had when I was a student doing English, English and classics as, as a degree. And it was when I started reading the poetry of Robert Browning, I ended up doing my PhD on Robert Browning's poetry, a great 19th century poet. And in his day, and latterly, he's often attacked because his style is very convoluted and difficult and he's often obscure. It's quite hard to work out what he's saying. He's kind of ugly a lot of the time, stylistically. And he was interested in unusual people and um, 
cripples and, and insane people and, and the weird side of life. And his contemporary said, well, why are you doing this? It's just ugly. This isn't beautiful at all. And he said something which has really, really struck me with a kind of force. He said, the thing is, I'm, I'm not so much interested in art as I'm interested in the obstacles to art. And when I thought about that, it occurred to me that the thing that makes Jimi Hendrix's version of the Star Spangled, Ban Star -Spangled Banner more beautiful than just a regular version of the Star Spangled Banner is that he messes it up, that he, 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 he dirties it, he obscures it, he puts in all sorts of feedback effects and strange contortions, and that makes it more interesting and more beautiful. The thing that makes Picasso a greater painter than Jack Vetriano, not that I'm knocking Jack Vetriano, I am, he's rubbish, don't, don't buy any of his paintings, but Picasso was interested in the way that you could creatively obscure and get in the way of that clarity. I think that's, I think that's interesting because the, 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 in science everything is obscured. It took us, with 2020 hindsight, looking back through the Enlightenment and you know, looking through human progress since, since the Greeks mm. and this onward march, the, the, the vast majority of human existence has been confusion and broken mm. things. And looking back only within the last hundred years do we see something a little bit more consistent. And so, so, so the thought experiment, so one thought experiment, is the pure distillation of the concept behind that. Uh, and, and to encode that, that idea in one something very simple, like, like, like to, to discuss it and to have that idea. And it's, that, it's like a little jewel of that thought mm. that you just lock away and you could discuss uh, in an evening or you could write down uh, in a two-line email and you'd have that distillation of that clarity and that's why I think those have survived they mm. you know they, they there are pages about them people write book you know write short stories about them people would actually still discuss them yeah even if they were completely resolved they represent maybe a hundred maybe maximum in physics there I say 20 for me classics which right. have been preserved and because they are clear they are well preserved. They don't have the distortion of, oh, it's actually really complicated. Yeah. That looks like wood, or I don't know, earth, wind, fire, water, you know, really different elemental uh, objects. Yeah. And so, but the, the idea that you would have these paradoxes and these thought experiments that live on as, as guides, right, as effectively uh, uh, little, little memes, little concepts that we, we can carry with us and adapt and use and think about, I think is to get around, not, it doesn't take anything away from, from the, the, the broken way we see the world. Not the broken way, but- No, no, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that. And I'm not suggesting that it's not, you know, I'm not suggesting that a Mozart piano sonata is not beautiful or that neoclassical architecture is not beautiful or that, you know, Jean Jack David's paintings are not beautiful. They're very, they have great clarity and great precision in the way that they- Exactly. That, that's, that's fine. I just don't think they're as, I don't think they're as eloquent about what it means to be a human being as art that is messed up, that is interested in, in the obstacles to art as much as it is interested in, in the art. And I think, and I'd go a bit further than that, and here I am going to trespass on your territory, because it seems to me the various bits and pieces of the universe that you look at and you, you get more and more data about and you become more and more certain about, I mean, I, I appreciate that you're not dealing in absolute certainties and everything is falsifiable and, and what have you, but you've got... You know, you're, you're much more sure now about the first second of the universe after the Big Bang than we were 100 years ago and so on. <clears throat> That's all wonderful, and it's a tremendous achievement of humanity, but it's all framed within uh, something that is unknowable, in a particular physics sense of the word. So the universe is either infinite or finite, and it can't really be both. The universe is either infinitely divisible, if we go down to the subatomic particles, we can either keep dividing them and dividing them and dividing them forever, or else there's going to be a kind of root particle that can't be divided, out of which everything else is assembled. It can't be both. No. Uh, but you can't tell me which it is. Nope. Uh, doesn't, that, doesn't that frame everything you say, though? But then isn't... On the smallest scale and on the largest scale, you don't know. But it's about the range at which we cover. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm not, we're not... Do you think the universe is infinitely divisible? 
I do not, my personal, I, actually when you get to these questions, it's more opinion ah, than anything. Everything comes in little chunks, quanta, quanta yeah. mechanics, quanta. So why isn't the universe itself have an infinitely small chunk that you can't divide? Yeah. The actual fabric of space and time. Also, I, I think ultimately time in itself and space will come in chunks. But this is as much my own personal belief as it is based in science. Mm. There's no, there's no, there's no good reason to believe one or the other. Yeah. I, I but think you think it will be resolved someday. I, you, physicists, however glum they might look, are weirdly optimistic. I really think that yeah. Yeah, even though they, they, they could meet a physicist who's incredibly sour. They, Hard to imagine. <laughs> I'd <have to> say. <laughs> no, they exist. No, there's some you know, sour <laughs> physicists, and uh, they, they would. Uh, they would ultimately think somewhere deep down, if you probe far enough into their head, however negative they appeared, like, oh no, physics can't do anything about this, somewhere deep down in their mind, they would believe that some part of the universe was amenable to explanation with mathematics and physics. Yeah. If, you, if you ask them the, the different, if you ask them, it's basically the same question, do you believe there's any scope for a piece, for a piece of the universe which is l not within your remit? And, mm. and even though they may say, oh, very early in the Big Bang or very late into the universe or somewhere here, ultimately, I think they, they, they would, they, it, would, it would fall under our, it would, we would eventually expand mm. to occupy the entire universe in all time and all space. That's the triumph of hope over experience. <laughs> exactly. I mean, the, the way I come at it is, um, this is one of the, the core pillars of Kant philosophy. Since we started with Olber, who was a German scientist, we can bring in Kant, who's a German philosopher. You've heard of Kant. I always think of Brian Kant, who was a, a presenter on children's television when I was a child, but I don't think they're related in any way. In his Critique of Pure Reason, Kant frames exactly this question, but he has a particular answer to it. So he says, this question of whether the universe can be infinitely divided or whether there is a kind of basic atom that's at the root of everything, the question of whether the universe is infinitely big or is finite, the question of whether the universe has a starting point in time, because if it starts at one particular time, then what happened before then, or whether the universe has always existed, these he calls his antimonies, and they're core to his philosophy. And what he says, the reason he frames it in those terms is he says these are fundamentally irreconcilable explanations for the way things are, that you can't, you can't prove one or the other. There are problems with both explanations. If the universe has existed for all time, that, that has all sorts of problems with that. How can that possibly be? If the universe started at a certain time and didn't exist before that time, then where does it come from? But one of the two has to be true. Either it, it started at some point in time or it's always existed. There's not a third option there. And he, he thinks the same is true with the physical dimensions of the universe. He thinks that those antimonies are, are baked into the nature of the, the way that things actually are, that we're framed by unknowables, if you like. Mm. And that we can nibble away at all the stuff in the middle, and that's fine. But that's, and that his whole philosophy is based on that idea. Actually, that this the, this is the, the, the fundamental, if you like. This is the bedrock on which he then goes on to construct his whole. I mean, he was a philosopher rather than a scientist. He didn't do any experimental work. He didn't gather any data. He just sat in his office and I suppose thought of that stuff. I suppose the one where we have this major change is I always go back to thinking about Einstein and space and time itself. Because really this was, a, this was a theater set where the actors would play out their part. Mm. And that was really, a, the, the universe was you know, that theater set. And of course uh, the planets and all the little particles would dance out their, 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 uh, their Shakespearean uh, play. And then, and then a physicist came along and completely readdressed that concept. Something which was effectively, in that sense, we can't, unknowable. He, yeah. We have a backdrop, of course, you would have a setting to where, yeah. where the main activity would happen. And so, there, so I, that's the only place I can appeal to that being different, was somebody did come along and completely redraw the boundaries of what we were allowed to go for. Mm. And we are following in those footsteps. Yeah. Yeah, so that's why. And that, it's just one guy, it's one Austrian, who, who we follow in the footsteps of and think, well, if he could do it, I mean, okay, I, I don't think I could, but of course, other physicists. So I, it's, it's hard to say, so I, w I wouldn't like to bet either way. I wouldn't like to say either way, so I don't know. I think there are things we, should, we thought weren't even part of our 
our world in terms of physics and, and knowing or not knowing. Right. So I, I, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't want to call it. I think it's right. I wouldn't like say either way. It's un, it's, if, uh, even saying that's unknowable, how do you know that? <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's, that's the power. <laughs> how do you know that something is yeah, unknowable? Any, I just, I, the last thing I'd say is I'm not, I'm not advocating kind of obfuscation for the sake of it. I'm not suggesting we should all be gullible and believe in astrology and stick our heads in the ground. It's a wonderful thing to find out about the universe. And there are better and worse ways of finding out about the universe. But I do think that if the, the, the unconsidered dedication to the light is a kind of misunderstanding of the way things are. I think the light is, you know, one tenth of one twentieth of the cosmos, actually. All the different kinds of light that, that you've made your career out, career out of. Mm. But I don't know. If somebody would uh, study the dark. The speed of dark has to be faster <laughs> the speed than of the dark speed of light. is the same as the speed no, of light. It's not, it it's not a tug of Bad news travels faster <laughs> than <the> good news. <laughs> exactly. <news. laughs> but obviously, the dark is getting ahead of the light, so it must be faster. <laughs> That's the, the, the dark reason. is an absence of light. So if, if light travels at the speed of light, dark is clearly going to travel is, at the speed. Withdrawing at the speed of light. Yes, I suppose that makes a kind of sense.